the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. A lot of people are wondering, is September of 2012 going to be a repeat of September of 2008, or could it be even worse? Well, Francis Cianfraca writes a lot about this. He's been thinking a lot about it, and he's here now to discuss it. Hey, Francis, how you doing? Just fine, Kerry. Thanks for having me back. Great to be with you. Hey, it's good to have you back, too. So we're talking bad things always seem to happen in the fall, don't they? <laughs> Yes, and I think that uh, specifically with regard to financial markets, financial crises, financial panics, go back in history, and it's a fascinating study. But uh, you're right, they do tend to happen in the fall. And in history, if you go back and look at financial patterns of how you know capital gets deployed, there's an interaction with agriculture because for you know a long centuries, what would happen in the United States? Well, so let's call it more than a century, all right you would have farmers in the Midwest, and growing food, of course, is the primary activity of any economy, right? That's what you got to do is feed sure. people. And farmers would borrow money in the springtime, and where was the money? It was in New York. So what would happen is you would go through the summer, and money would have left New York, you know, going go to buy farm equipment and seed and other, other things, literally get, getting put in the ground, okay? And, and the harvest comes in in September and October, and if there are problems, that's when they show because people's money is out and everyone is illiquid. Okay, so if you get a crisis like the famous Knickerbocker crisis of October 1907, right. right? The stresses in the system will tend to appear at those times. And of course, after the harvest is in, then everybody's liquid again, and you go back to sleep for the winter. <laughs> you know how that that plays out these days. I think it's it's less. The, the impact of agriculture on our financial system is less, but you still definitely do see the, uh, the the September effect. I can remember the days of 2008 like they were yesterday, and August of 08 was a very funky month. Of course, August of 07 was when the crisis really started sure. with the BNP Paribas issue, um, you know, suspension of redemptions from those three funds. That was the the harbinger. That was the, that was the beginning of the crisis. You know, although the, the rest of the world didn't catch up to, I mean, the non-financial world didn't catch up until 08, but uh, August of 08 was a very strange month. Um, there were, July of 08 was full of problems with Freddie Mac, remember? Mm -hmm. And then it was like right around Labor Day, things just started feeling really weird in the capital markets, overnight repo that I follow closely. And of course, after Labor Day, everything went pear-shaped. And we're kind of in that August period when all the, 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 the trading desks, all the B players are on the desks because the A players are on the beach. And that's true here in the United States. It's also very much true in Europe. Oh, yeah, so, two-month vacation whatever, that's take there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the stresses that are building now, you know, you, you got to wonder if when people come back in early September, uh, if we're going to see some, some issues, if some issues materialize, that's what we're, you know, watching. And, I won't say afraid of, I, that's the wrong word. And 08 was also an election year. An election year, yes, indeed. And, of course, the financial crisis in 08, when the acute crisis that erupted in September of 08 totally scrambled that election. Oh, I'm yeah. remembering, yeah, I, I, I'm sure you have vivid memories, too. I remember right after the uh, Republican convention, Sarah Palin, it seemed like Barack Obama was, was running against Sarah Palin, <laughs> right? Yeah. In those first yeah, couple of weeks of September, then the crisis shows up and everything after that was scrambled. Yep, very true. Very true. And we could be looking at something similar because now it looks like Obama's running against Ryan. I didn't even – I think Romney's yeah. on the ticket. I thought he was at the top. But he's uh, he's like the Maytag repairman of this election. Uh, they just leave him alone. And 
Biden seems like he's uh, entered a new oh, dimension. Oh, he's off a leash. My goodness, the things he's saying. I, yeah, which which says that uh, he's uncontrollable. Things. I mean, Frank, you, yeah. you got. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Kerry. You, you got to figure, no matter what party you 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 are sympathetic to, or no matter who you're going to vote for, some of the stuff he's saying is nuts. Oh, he, he's insane. You know, I mean, I have thought for a long time that the guy, you know, was a couple of uh, sandwiches short of a picnic, <laughs> and uh, and he's done nothing to uh, to disabuse us of that of that notion, has he? Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it, uh, Biden is one of those guys, Bill Clinton in the same category, very different comparison, but uh, natural politician. Uh-huh. I've seen this because because I've been involved in political activities. My wife has as well. There are people, anybody who's done retail politics mm-hmm. has to know this. There are some guys, you know, uh, usually older guys. Sometimes they're good looking, sometimes they're not, but they just have a magnetic way with crowds. And Biden is like that. He's just a, a great politician, but a uh, policymaker? No, I don't think so. I don't know. I never, uh, never understood the attraction of this guy because, to me, he just you know he's always trying to make him. Well, I don't like to get into politics, but he's always trying to make him make you believe he's one of the middle class and you know son of a truck driver and all that stuff. And you know the the reality just seems to be so far. Different from well, the shtick. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, a lot exactly. of politicians play that game. Romney is going to do that to some degree as well. Yeah, how does but, he uh, do it though? I mean, he he's an elite. He's <laughs> grew up as an elite, and he'll always yeah. be an elite. So, <laughs> so how do you do that? Uh, yeah. I think the answer, uh, experience is showing, uh, observation is showing. The answer is not terribly well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then he gets Ryan in there who uh, basically draws all the attention away from his deficiencies. And I don't think Ryan is the solution to anything myself because, right. you know, it's because uh, you can't have incremental change with these entitlement programs. And anybody who says you could just change incrementally over time and everything is going to be okay is not being honest about it. Because no, nothing, and I think that know, I play this game over and over again in my head. And I just don't see the, the the fiscal effects and the economic effects of massive the massive debt position we have in the United States. Um, it, it's not clear, and that's just an honest statement. I, you know, you, you, a lot of people with a lot of justification will tell you, well, the end point of that is hyperinflation. That's obvious, right. but it, it didn't happen in Japan, and it's not happening here. And so you got to wonder if, you know, I'm by no way, the, the people on the other side who will say, oh, this is sustainable, we can do this forever, they're wrong too. But yeah. the problem is there's no historical experience to tell you how this is going to go. So it's very, very frightening. You know, and when I, when I look at things like the Ryan plan, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think any of that can be enacted without a major crisis. It's just, you know, there's not going to be that immediately urgent uh, financial market disorder, but if that does come, if that should happen sometime in the next four or five or ten years, uh, or in the next two months maybe, yeah, never uh, know. You then never obviously know. something's going to happen. And what scares me about that, Kerry, is that uh, you know we got a lot of really goofy policy responses in 2008. I think the most intelligent and useful ones were from the Federal Reserve, and that's a bigger subject. You may disagree well out with me. I'm sure some of your listeners do as well. <laughs> but I will say. The Fed behaved very well under extreme crisis conditions, and the reason they did it is because they're the least accountable policy actor in Washington, so they had the most freedom of action. Right. right. So what worries me is that in the next crisis, when so many things have changed with that, Frank, TARP will not be possible, nothing like it. Yeah. So the Fed is going to have to improvise, and who knows how that's going to go. But you know, very, very uncertain. There's the argument that all they succeeded in doing in the last uh, fiscal crisis was kicking the can down the road, and oh, that, that's true. they haven't solved anything. <laughs> no doubt about that. So, so, you know, maybe it's preferable to an immediate disaster to have them kick the can down the road, but it doesn't really solve anything. I mean, you can't deny that. Let me tell you what worries me the most. I mean, we're looking closely at the situation in Europe. Okay, and you, you you started the show by talking by asking the question, 
is September 2012, like September 2008. The one, the most vivid, immediate thing that is different mm-hmm. is that the data is not there. Okay, yeah. I was telling people in the spring of '07 that something whack was happening in in the capital markets. By June of '07. We, we knew something was very wrong. 07, not 08. Yeah. June of 07, we knew things were wrong with Bear Stearns. August of 07, the crisis starts. And the fourth quarter of 07 was a plus 4% GDP year. Uh-huh. People were telling me, you're absolutely nuts. We're not even in recession. Yeah. So, uh, and then 08 happens. But there were a lot of signals. The capital markets were throwing off a lot of signs of disorder and stress. And the, 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 the signs were there to read. That's not happening now. You Why? Think, uh, because, yeah. because the Fed and because uh, the ECB have put so much liquidity into the system. It's like morphine. <laughs> right? If there's going to be a crisis, it'll happen. It'll come out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's signs coming, though. I think uh, I think we're seeing it. The zero percent interest rate zerp is uh, is really one of the symptoms of it because nobody is borrowing money. So mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know yeah. if there's that's no, yeah you know there's no justification for taking a risk. Exactly. There's, there's no there's no there's no incremental returns to risk. So what everybody does is they invest risk free, and then there's a, a very large class of investors, namely U.S. banks, that have no choice but to invest risk free because yeah. strictly speaking they're undercapitalized, and the only reason they aren't getting shut down is because that's going to cost the government too much. So they all pretend, yeah. and what that means is the only thing you're allowed to uh, invest in is treasury debt uh-huh. because you don't have to reserve capital against it, right? Yeah. And that's what the government wants anyway because they need to sell that stuff at low interest rates. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is sucking the life out of the uh, economy, right? Thank you. You know, yep. I mean, couldn't uh, agree more. Nobody can deny it's a that. disaster. Yeah. So, so what are you really accomplishing? By, mm-hmm. by kicking the can down the road. We're, Here's we're what you're accomplishing, and I think yeah. if, you, if it were possible to give ben- Member Nanke truth serum, he would <laughs> say this, all right? Yeah. And the answer is that we are buying financial stability. In other words, we're buying the absence of widespread bank failures at the price of economic stagnation. Yeah. And Europe is making exactly the same trade. They're doing, it, they're doing it almost explicitly. They're almost being honest about it. Yeah, well, you know... Unfortunately, you know that it it can't go on that way because there's a limit to how much money can be printed, and there's a limit to how much extend and pretend, and and the the way we're suffering here also is that uh, that there's no more markets. There's just these interventions taking place by by the federal government, and how does that help us? Yeah, it's. Um... Well, <laughs> is it sustainable? I th- I think, you know, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, she wrote the uh, she was uh, co-author of the book This Time Is Different with Ken Rogoff. Uh-huh. She talks about financial repression, which is policy by monetary policymakers, monetary authorities, in which they will uh, maintain basically y- y- keeping the economy at the edge of deflation. Right. Right. And that is a way of keeping everything from going unstable. And it is an explicit policy of transferring real wealth from savers and investors to the stakeholders of banks, of financial institutions. Because the financial institutions, they're, you know, in, in, a, in a proper world, I don't know if you want to say it that way, uh, in a different kind of world, they would be failing. Mm-hmm. You know, they would be paying for the mistakes that they made, the bad investments, et cetera, et cetera. They're not because policymakers are explicitly saying that's worse than, you know, uh, uh, we don't want that kind of outcome, especially since we're, we'll get blamed for it as policymakers, yeah, right? And Congress sure. will you know, get thrown out of office, blah, blah, blah. They don't want that. So the trade they're making is they're keeping the inco- economy at the edge of deflation. Transfer- the effect of there being no zero interest rates, right? No, no risk-adjusted rates of return readily available in the economy. Uh, there's no way for, for, for your grandmother to buy a bank CD and earn a rate of return, a real rate of return, right? Sure. So the net effect of that is that we're transferring wealth and slowly over time recapitalizing the banks. And frankly, 
I think it's terrible because they don't deserve it. But uh, that's kind of the answer to your question. That's how long it's going to take. However long it lasts, whether it's five years or ten years, for the large incumbent U.S. banks to come back to a reasonable capital position, that's how long it's going to take. I don't know. With these derivatives, we could be one sneeze away from a global collapse, and there won't right. be anything that and can stop And we don't know it. that. Yeah, one of these don't too big that. to fails fails. That's end game. And it's not just in the U.S., these too big to fails. They're all over the world, and that's that's really the problem is that nobody knows how bad the system is, how precariously perched it is, except for the insiders and uh, and probably the Fed, but they're not talking about it, and we could be a lot closer to that mega collapse uh, than we were even in 2008, and that's the scary part is nobody's telling us the truth. So anyway, Francis, we've got to wrap up, but as always, thought-provoking, and you make people think, which is why we'd love to have you on FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. And if you want to hear this interview as well as others, Francis and other financial luminaries around the world have done, just uh, check us out there. Francis, if people want to find out more about you and uh, check out your writing, you've got a few places they can go. Well, um, they're welcome to go to redstate.com. I also do, these days I do less writing and more speaking. I do a podcast twice a week called Coffee and Markets, and your listeners are invited to check it out if they have an interest. Excellent. And I've checked it out myself. I enjoy it, although I think I'm a better interviewer than him, but we can talk about that. <laughs> but, but seriously, it's I it's think a you're good... a great interviewer, Kerry. I'd love to be on with you. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good podcast. I try to listen to everything that I can, but when you're doing it, it gets harder and harder to listen to other stuff because, I mean, it isn't like I just go on the phone and then, and then I'm off. It's it's a process throughout the day where I'm I'm doing this whether I'm on or not. It's it's strange oh, yeah. to explain, but but hey, I really appreciate you coming on, especially the fact you're a New Yorker, uh, you know, and we just have a different uh, outlook towards things, I think, than others. <laughs> a different geological, geographical yeah. viewpoint on the world. Well, we're much more pragmatic because, you know, you can get from uh, 42nd Street and uh, Broadway down to uh, the Battery 15 different ways but we're always looking for the best way to go with the least hassle, the most direct route, but not necessarily the most direct, but the fastest. And, you know, we think about those things. And I don't think the rest of the country really thinks about getting from point A to point B the way that New Yorkers do. That's what differentiates What I want us. to do is, from a high point uh, at Times Square and Broadway, what I want to do, 42nd Street Broadway, what I want to do is I want to get onto that uh, X-51 wave ride. Oh, airplane, yeah. <laughs> the hypersonic airplane, and yeah. I, want to be with, I want to be at Battery Park in about 15 milliseconds. That's what yeah. I want. I want to be there before I left. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> before I even thought there I wanted go. to go there, I want let's, to be let's there. Let's violate some laws of, uh, of, uh, laws of physics while we're at it. That's yeah, fun what too. the heck. We could dream. So anyway, hey, we'll talk to you again <laughs> after the summer break. And enjoy the rest of it because things are sure going, they're going to be heating up. So you be well. All right, you too.